How's the day going? HTTP had... We have to do that again. How's the day going? <laughs> HTTP headers for the responsible developer. Let me tell you about my journey on the web. So I was one of these lucky people that had already an internet connection at home very early because my father was a tech-savvy person. But actually, in the beginning, I had no idea what I should do with this internet, right? I could Google stuff, but that was basically it. And I was, whatever, 12 years old. And it was not that exciting. But then I discovered this website, uboot.com. Any Germans around? That, that was a, one of the first social networks in Germany. And there it was, 1999. And this is where I'm coming from, the middle of nowhere, north of Germany. And I found myself chatting to people in Berlin, mainly about music. And this is when I found out for the first time that the web actually connects people. It's not about Googling stuff. It's about connecting people. Then I moved to Berlin. And I had a different job initially. In 2010, something interesting happened. I became a web developer, which is cool. But then the statement that the web connects people actually changed. We as developers have a lot of power. And I 100% believe that we connect now people, because we're building stuff for the internet. We enable people. And we help people by the stuff that we built. So let me quickly introduce myself. Hey. I'm Stefan. I work for a company called Trilio. We do communications as an API. So if you want to do SMS, WhatsApp, phone calls, and all these kind of things, you can check that out. And the most important thing is that, hey, I'm Stefan, and I want to be a responsible developer. So when we look at the global population, you will find out that 1999, there I was in my little bubble north of Germany, not much going on. But where are actually the most internet users are coming from today? So they're coming from. Uh, China, India, and the United States. But this is just global statistics, right? But I also do run a private blog, and only the last month I had 300 people from Brazil reading my articles. I had 100 people from Vietnam, and I had 80 people from South Africa. That gets me really excited, right? Who am I? I'm writing stuff, and people in, in Brazil are reading my stuff. But at the end, that really doesn't matter. Because we, as web developers, should be building for everybody. And when responsive web design came up, I heard this statement way too often. We don't have users coming from a certain area. We don't have users that um, use a certain device. When you say these kind of statements, what you're actually doing is you're creating a chicken and egg problem. When you don't build stuff that works for people under certain conditions, these people won't use your stuff. But building a good website these days is actually very, very hard. Because what do you have to do? You have to consider design. Colors are the, around the world are different. You have to bring up good content. You have to consider web performance, which is a big topic by itself. You have to make uh, your stuff accessible, because there may be people that um, visit your sites with assistive technology. You have to find out, what should I use, actually? Frameworks wars are a thing, right? We're at JSConf here. Um, you have to optimize the network stack, and you have to make it work on several devices. And there are many, many more factors out there. And in the next 21 minutes, I want to um, talk about the network stack. So let's talk about HTTP. So basically, when your browser makes a, a request to a resource, what it does, it sends you a set of key value pairs. These are called request headers. And then the server responds with, the, um, with another set of um, key value pairs and the actual resource that you're asking for. So we're dealing with response and request headers. And when I started preparation for this talk, .den, .dev domains were actually trending, so I had to buy a .dev domain. So here you see the responsible .dev, and this is site, but it has right now JavaScript disabled. So what you see here when I refresh it, there's some stuff going on. First of all, the script is hijacking, adding it unicorns and stuff. But also, when you go to CodePen, for example, you can just frame this site, and you can pretend to be my site. You could click jack and track what people are doing pretending to be my unicorn, not unicorn site, my responsible dev site. So what I wanted to do is that I wanted to make this site better by just using headers. And to start the whole topic is that the web is a scary place. A few months ago, this was kind of in the news. Lots of websites were mining cryptocurrency, and the developers that built these sites didn't even know about this. 
And the reason for that is that when we're building for the web is that we're always relying on other people building software. Open source is the thing, right? And we also um, load uh, third parties from different domains. So we always rely on others, and I believe that the web has to be safe. The biggest part of being safe is HTTPS. So without HTTPS, what is possible is that someone can open up a public Wi-Fi, and when you're browsing with HTTP, this person could pretend to be the Wi-Fi and could interfere all the requests and just mess with you, or get all the passwords that you're typing and sending through over HTTP. But also, HTTPS enables you to use cutting-edge features like HTTP2, service workers, and get using media. And I, in my front-end bubble, I think that HTTPS is already a standard. But for example, there's this site out there that is called Why No HTTPS? And it lists many, many sites that are not enforcing HTTPS yet. And when you look, um, uh, when you go into this list, you will find out that RD, that's a massive German media outlet, is not enforcing HTTPS, which is very, very surprising. So when you run then on HTTPS, what you want to do is that you maybe want to ensure that it is always HTTPS and on a secure connection. So what you can do is you can set the strict transport security header which you can define a max H property in seconds. This will tell the browser, hey, please only use this website or this resources over HTTPS. You can define how wide it should range. And you can, if you want to be, uh, go the extra mile, you can define a preload directive, which basically allows you to submit your site to another site, which is called HSTS preload. And the thing about that is that browsers internally keep a list of websites that should only run on HTTPS. This is the configuration file that is included in Chromium. This is just a massive array, including thousands of sites that will never work on HTTP. In case you wonder why .dev domains are not possible to use over HTTP anymore, that's the reason. .dev is inside of this file. But HSTS is not only about security. What happens when you type something in the address bar of your browser? The browser will make an HTTP request initially, which, when you're on a slow connection, could lead to a delay of three, four, five seconds, depending on the connection. With HTTPS, you can skip this request, because the browser knows we are going HTTPS. That's it. So how's the support for HTTPS? We're pretty green here, which is pretty sweet. But enforcing HTTPS is not the easiest thing in the world when you're dealing with big projects where a lot of people are basically um, putting a lot of source code in your, in your code base. So how do you tackle this approach to go to over HTTPS? When you run your site over HTTPS and you make a request to an HTTP resource, it may be blocked by the browser. So what you can do is you can set a content security policy header with the upgrade insecure request directive, and this magically updates all the requests to be HTTPS and secure. That is super cool. But this is not the main purpose of CSP. The main purpose of CSP is that you want to limit what is allowed inside of your websites. And you can configure a lot of things. So this is the complete list of what is possible with CSP. You can define where should fronts be loaded from, where should images be loaded from. And there are a few cutting edge things in there, like this on Opener, Navigate 2. And I think that's very exciting, because you basically can trim down what is allowed in your website, and you can avoid mining um, cryptocurrency in your website because a third party got hacked. You can use CSP with a meta element in your HTML, or you set a header like this. This is the header that I ship for my private website, and includes all the third parties that I have. And coming up with this is actually very, very hard. I deployed CSP three times and broke my site and rolled back. So what you want to do is you want to set a different header, which is report only, which then allows you to define an HTTP endpoint. And then you get all the warnings of requests that would, would be blocked if this would be active. And you can start monitoring what is going on. When you watch this, when you have a detailed look at this rule set, you will find out that there is something not that right. I have unsafe inline and unsafe evil right now in there, and it bothers me. But I'm using a JavaScript framework that inlines um, JavaScript JSON in the body so that the JavaScript front-end framework gets the state. Um, and I'm, fixing, I'm working on fixing that, but it's not the easy thing when you're dealing with a framework. The way that this should work is that inline scripts, when you have CSP enabled, you have two ways. You can either define a hashed value in your CSP directive, so that you can say, hey, 
this hashed value should be allowed in my website. This is a little bit brittle, though, because now, when you update your contents of the script, then you have to change this header or your meta element in the head. What you can also do is you can define a nonce value, which is basically giving an ID, and you can say, hey, yeah, this, this part is cool. Please allow this. So also support for CSP. CSP is uh, out there in two levels. Level one, all green, pretty cool. Cutting edge stuff and more fancy stuff is um, a little bit jumpy still, and then my thing's missing, but you can have a look about that. At that. So I think this technology is actually very exciting because it makes the web a safer place. But how many pages actually use CSP? So there's this website out there that is called httparchive.org, which crawls the internet, and then you can write search queries. And when you do that, you will find out that only 6% of the internet or of the crawled websites use CSP. This is surprisingly low, and I think we can do better. So when you want to start working with CSP, start in report mode, monitor what is coming in and out, don't break your site, and then when you only when you are safe and you know that all your requests, resources are whitelisted, then you can turn it on. So for my responsible dev side, what I did is I added a new route, which is slash safe, and I set some headers. So first of all, you see that the unicorns are gone, because the request that went there is not allowed. Chrome is also reporting me that I'm using something that is not reported yet. But also, when I now go to CodePen and go to the framing site, Chrome will say, hey, this is not allowed for this site, so people cannot hijack my stuff, which is pretty cool, because this makes my site safer. And this is very important, because the web is crucial for people. I travel quite a little bit, and what happens when, for example, I go to, I was in the Ukraine, Ukraine uh, two months ago, so I get out of a plane, and I get this SMS message by my mobile provider, and basically tells me this, and just because this is ridiculous, I get two, six megabytes for two euros, but I have to use this in 24 hours. This doesn't even hold me 30 minutes. The web has to be affordable, and this is a crucial um, piece for us building a good internet. So one thing that we have to do there is that don't request the same content over and over and over again. And what you can do to avoid that is you can set proper caching headers. Caching is very, very tricky. And I'm only going briefly into it, so I'm defining there that in seconds a max age property and telling, hey, this is how, how long this resource could be potentially cached. But this doesn't necessarily mean that there are no requests flying, because browser also revalidate if the re resource is changed. So what is cool that is you can also define a mutable directive, which then tells the browser, hey, this is maybe a hashed value, like styles, hash.css or JS or something, and the browser will never request it again. It will not revalidate stuff. I think that's very cool, because this way you can save some requests. Unfortunately, the support for immutable is not that great anymore, because it was supported in Edge, but Edge now switched to Chromium. So if you want to learn more about caching, I can highly recommend to check out this article by Harry Roberts. It goes over all the directives, and if you want to learn how to set proper caching control headers, um, you can check this out. It's not only about requests, though. It's also about sending the right data. So what happens when your browser requests some HTML? What it does is it sends some um, a header that is called accept encoding, and it tells the server, hey, this is what I understand. Cool. And you see the gzip, deflate, and broadly. And broadly is a different compression algorithm, and what you see there is that I took a CSS file and I compressed it with the two different uh, compression algorithms. So you see that broadly by itself is a little bit smaller than gzip. But surprisingly, people are not using that very often, because what the whole industry thinks is that broadly compression is so slow, it's so hard to encode. So when you use gzip, usually what happens is that the server automatically compresses it on the fly and makes it gzip. With broadly, it may be a little bit slow. But when you say this sentence, what you're basically doing is that you're comparing apples with oranges. So let's have a look at how gzip and broadly works. gzip basically has nine uh, modes that it can run in. Broadly has 11. When you use these in default mode, gzip runs in level 6, and Broadly runs in level 11. The thing, though, is that level 6 in gzip is there to be optimized for speed and compression ratio. The Broadly default mode is there only to save the most amount of file um, size. 
So when you tweak broadly a little bit, and you go not with the default mode, but rather with level four, it tends to compress better with the same speed on the fly. You can set this and save some bytes on the wire. But maybe you have a build process in place, and maybe you don't even want to compress it on the fly because you have a build process in place. Right? You could j compress all your files with Broadly and then statically serve them to save some kilobytes. If you want to learn more about this, this topic, the, um, the friends from Akamai did extensive research about what this means. So what's the support of Broadly? We're pretty there. All the big sites like Facebook, Dropbox, they are shipping Broadly, and I, th I would hope that we do more things with this. But it's not only about compression, it's also about serving tailored media because images are mainly the thing that costs the most amount of data on the web. So and when, you do, when you're uh, doing front-end and you want to ship, for example, an image format that is called WebP, which tends to be a little bit smaller than JPEG, you find yourself building things like this. This is a picture element, responsive images for several sizes, and it also ships WebP when the browser understands it. This is horrible, right? You do feature detection, this will break when the next person comes in. But get what, guess what? The browser also tells the server what image formats it understands. So what you could do potentially for browsers that support WebP is that you could read this header and you can serve a uh, WebP image instead of a JPEG when the browser tells you that this works. But you can get, go even further when someone requests your website and you set, for example, the accept CA header, this stands for client hint, you can tell the browser, hey, I would like to know how wide your viewport is, and please tell it to me for the next 100 seconds. What happens then for the additional image requests is that the browser will tell you dimensions of the images. I mean, how cool is that? This means that you can use normal images without all the responsive images stuff, but you have to give it a sizes attribute um, so that the browser upfront knows how this image is laid out. And this is then the request that goes out. It will tell viewport width and width of the image. And guess what? When you're on a high, density, den, uh, high pixel resolution display, it will tell you the real size of the image. You can then serve proper images via server-side um, generation or service worker, which is pretty, pretty cool. I'm very excited about this. This is a little bit cutting edge, though. If you want to learn more about client hints, what you can do is you can check out this resource by Jeremy Ragnar. He does a lot of cool things around this topic. So I tweaked another side of my responsible dev sites. So you see there, slash affordable. So what you see there, that is that I'm shipping broadly. And you see there also that the image element is a JPEG, but I'm serving WebP without any markup changes. And it tells me how big the image is. And when I now change the viewport, you will see that the image uh, will get smaller because the server knows what resources I should ship and what image would be the perfect fit here. So the web has to be affordable because the web is with us every day. Unfortunately, we reached this state in the web right now. It's not playing. Here we go. This is made by a former colleague of mine. <laughs> this is where we are, right? We are web developers. This is what we built. I believe that the web has to be respectful. And the, one of the most things that we should honor more is time. And we should get the stuff that we ship down more quickly. So what you can do is you can optimize the loading process for certain things, and you can use link rel pre preload in your HTML, or you can set a header, which then gives some information to the, uh, to the browser telling, hey, you will need this resources. Please start loading it, because a person maybe don't want, doesn't want to load, wait for a font to kick in and watch a blank screen. When you lose, use the HTTP header, you have to be a little bit careful, though, when you're using certain um, proxy servers or CDNs. Link will preload will lead to a server push command, which is then not taking the uh, browser cache of the, into consideration. So if you use this header, you have to use no push. This is great to speed up critical resources. So how is the support today for link rel preload? That's pretty good. So you can start adding these kind of things and optimize the loading process to maybe get your fonts or header images um, down quicker and optimize for the time of your visitors. The next thing is I want to talk about is the AMP reaction. So two and a half years ago, I was giving a talk about AMP and how it works technically. 
Actually, it's very interesting what they do. And when Amp was released, your advice, he does a lot of stand standard work and spec writing in, in the web ecosystem. What he did is when he saw that we need to come up with an alternative very, very quickly because AMP is very JavaScript driven. And that is very cool because now, two years later, what is slowly coming is the feature policy header. So what you can do there is you can define what should be allowed in your website. And there's a lot of cool stuff in, possible that you can configure. Should it be possible that a third-party script coming from somewhere accesses, um, wants to access my camera? I think this is cool that you can block a lot of things that shouldn't be possible by default. Unfortunately, we're now entering a little bit of cutting-edge technology here. But there are also very cool things in there, like uh, unoptimized media and unsized media and unoptimized images. This way, you can limit yourself and can tell the browser, I don't want to ship, even accidentally, massive images. You can then also define this for iframes. And there will be a JavaScript. It's already shipping in Chromium browsers. Um, there's also a JavaScript API that lets you access these values that came in via header. The JavaScript API is still under discussion, though, so please use that very carefully. So if you had a look at this list very uh, carefully, you might have noticed that there was one thing missing in this huge list of things that you don't want to allow on your site. What's the most annoying one in websites these days? Push notifications, right? People working on these kind of things figured out that handling push notifications and disallowing them is a little bit trickier than first thought. So if you want to learn more about how we go with these kind of things, um, you can follow this issue. So what's the support for feature policy? We're not that bad, which is pretty, pretty cool. So with these kind of headers, I set up another site which was slash respectful. And what you see there is that the permission dialog is gone because I don't allow it. And that also the JS config UPNG, which is in the bottom and uh, defined in CSS, um, I pushed that to be loaded quicker, which makes maybe the experience a little bit better. So building for the web is very, very, very hard these days. There are so many things to consider. You have to think about the design, the content, web performance, accessibility, frameworks, network, and devices. And there are surely more things that you have to consider when you're building for the web. So all things headers, this 20 minutes rundown was, is not a complete one. If you want to get a complete overview, my friend Shep um, maintains this slide deck. This is a massive resource if you want to know what HTTP headers are out there. And also, you can also just Google headers for hackers. So Andrew Betts um, also gives this fantastic talk if you want to learn more. So I really believe that the web has to be safe. It shouldn't be possible that my mother browses the web and mines cryptocurrency. That shouldn't be possible. It has to be affordable because people pay a different amount of money depending on which situation they are and where they are in the world. And it has to be respectful, respectful. because nobody li likes a person that is asking random questions and permissions all the time. So the web has to be safe, affordable, and respectful so that it really is for everybody. Thank you very much.